All right, uh, once again, uh, my name is John Wright with Taylor Farm, and uh, this is Farmer's Talk. And today we are in New Haven, Vermont, with um, Chris Granstrom of Lincoln Peak Vineyard. Can you tell me uh, just a little brief background of, of the history of Lincoln Peak? And uh, Sure, yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of work, work backwards, if, if that's all right. Um, right now we have about 12 acres of producing vineyard, or oh, a little less because we're in the process of replacing some. Well, for the last few years we've claimed to be the, the largest grape producer in Vermont. We, we may lose that title here in the next year or two, um, but we have, we have been. And uh, what I, I think the main thing that sets our business apart from a lot of the other wineries in the state is that we do grow all the grapes right here on our own property. Um, we're not importing grapes, which is great in the sense that we have complete control of the quality, the, all the decisions that have to be made in terms of growing and harvesting the grapes. Uh, but of course, it's limiting in that we can't decide to expand and bring in a more product and, and so it's, it's got, it works both ways. But I think it lends a certain amount of, um, I don't know, credibility, authenticity to what we're doing because it's really a local product. It, it's all grown right here. It's not imported from someplace else. So, and I, I think our customers, you know, respond to that. Uh, we started planting about 2000 and two uh, in terms of any size. I think we put in about half an acre in 2002. Uh, before that we had a strawberry farm here for about 24 years. So my daughter Sarah, whom we'll meet, uh, grew up in the strawberry business and, and uh, early on was out dealing with the public in a pretty intensive way. Um, and we, we actually started this strawberry farm way back in 1981 when my wife and I first moved to this property and built a house and, and, and got going. So it's, it's been, we've been here, we've been growing things and uh, for a long time. So, so why, why strawberries to grapes? I'm sure uh, that's your, that was yeah, going to be my next question. Next yeah. question. I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Um, well, it was a combination of things. Um, I mean, we've been doing the strawberries for a lot of years. Uh, our, our production wasn't quite as good. You know, we had a very generous crop rotations, but even so, we are, we are noted, we, of course, we were replanting back into the same field, even though in most cases, we would have had two, two and a half years of, of cover crops and green manure crops between, between strawberry plantings. And still, the vigor was starting to go down a little bit. Uh, and I think, personally, it was time for a kind of a new challenge in life. and. And also, we had just heard about them. Really, the most important reason is we had just heard about these new grape varieties that have been developed, uh, from mostly from University of Minnesota, and also from a private grape breeder out in Wisconsin, a, a fellow named Elmer Swenson. And we thought, well, this is this is going to take off in the north. You know, there's never been the possibility of growing good wine grapes in the north before, and and now there is. And you know. Let's get in on the ground floor. Uh, so we, we actually started as a, as a nursery, um, propagating and supplying vines to other, to other vineyards. Um, and you continue to do that as part of the we, business? We did. We, we, we are not doing it any longer, but we did it for about six or seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, to ha get the cuttings for the nursery, we had to have at least a small vineyard to go out and get the, the wood to, to propagate. And so we were growing grapes almost in spite of ourselves and then selling grapes to other wineries and, and finally we just couldn't stand to see ourselves putting all this effort into this beautiful crop and then loading it in the back of a truck and seeing it go up the road. So we, uh, we, started, we started making wine and then of course gradually, not of course, but the gradually the wine took over and we realized we couldn't do both and, and let, the, uh, let the nursery part of the business go. Now I'm completely out of my element here. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about vineyards. How many vineyards are there currently in Vermont? Yeah, well, that, that changes, and of course it depends on where you draw the line between kind of a hobby and a commercial vineyard. I, I think the answer is probably around 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. uh, there, um, 
a lot of them are sort of in the half acre to two acre range, which is sort of commercial, but just borderline, mm -hmm. you know, it's certainly mm -hmm. a supplemental thing. So, I mean, grapes have this kind of romantic image around them. People, you know, love to think the, of the idea of growing grapes and, and making wine. So a lot of people have, uh, kind of gotten bitten by the bug and, and decided to put in a half an acre or an acre and, and see what happens. And like anything else, you know, some realize it's not romantic at all. It's, it's mostly just hard, you know, repetitive manual work and they say it's not for me. Mm -hmm. and, and some others uh, love it and do a great job. Now what made this all possible? Fifteen years ago, Vermont wasn't considered a great growing right. region. Yeah, so that what's changed is really the genetics of the grapevines. Um, this fellow, Elmer Swenson, I mentioned, uh, a great story, grew up uh, on a little tiny dairy farm, <coughs> a dairy farm in Osceola, Wisconsin. Was, uh, I, don't, I don't think he went past eighth grade. I don't think he was ever interested in farming or dairy farming or cows, but he was one of these people that was put on earth with a purpose, you know, and his purpose was to work with grapes. And he spent a lifetime, and for the first, you know, 30 years of his grape growing career, in, in really in complete isolation, uh, hybridizing the old fashioned way with, you know, gathering pollen with a little paintbrush and painting it on the other, the flower of the other vine and marking it, saving the seeds, planting out the seeds, watching what develops, you know, doing, choosing the best of those, doing it over and over again. And uh, finally, you know, in, in, into his middle age, people started to realize what this guy was doing. And, and uh, they re people realized that, that he was creating this whole collection of grape varieties that were adapted to the Wisconsin climate. Um, and, and not to get too technical on you, but people that have had previously tried to breed grapes from northern, more northern climates, were, were using as kind of their base material a species called Vit Vitus, is the grape um, genus, a species called Vitus labrusca, which is kind of the conquered grape family. And the trouble with conquered grapes is they, you know, they taste like, you know, grape juice, grape jelly. Everybody knows what that tastes like, but they don't make very good wine. Mm -hmm. And what Elmer realized was to, for the most part, avoid that Vitus labrusca and use Vitus riparia, which is the wild grape that grows in Vermont mm -hmm. and grows all across the northern tier of states as kind of his, his genetic source of cold hardiness. Um, and, and Vitus riparia has its own challenges. It tends to be high in acid, uh, but it doesn't have those kind of off flavors that the Vitus labrusca brought to the wine grapes when it was in the genetic background. Mm -hmm. And so, Elmer, in, in his own way, had sort of taken grape breeding for northern climates down a, down a new road, so to speak. And uh, Did I you did, ever have the opportunity to I did. Him? I went yeah. out and spent a day with him. He was in his early 90s at the time, and uh, it, was, it was fascinating. It, it, yeah. it was just, just, a, just a great guy. And, and then as, as Elmer got, he, he passed away a few years ago, well in his 90s. Um, as, as his work got better known, the University of Minnesota um, picked up on pick, picked up on what he had done, and then with you know vastly more resources, of course, and and a more scientific rigor, and and you know not just following what he did, bringing in their own ideas, of course, um, have have continued a really active grape breeding program and have developed some wonderful varieties. So what we're growing here now includes some of Elmer's Swenson's grapes and some of the University of Minnesota grapes. Uh, but what changed, as to get back to your original question, you know, 15 years ago, was the availability of these new grape varieties that are adapted to this climate. Yeah. And are they well adapted? Are there are there still challenges here with this climate? Uh, and as far as winter hardiness, you know, at least in the Champlain Valley, uh, they're they're perfectly well adapted. There's there's no there's really no issue with winter damage here. Um, Something like spring frost, of course, is still an issue, but that's an issue any place. You know, if you're in California or you're in France, mm -hmm. Italy, they have trouble with spring frost. So that's just part of, that's just part of grape growing. Uh, so, uh, 
So what are some of the challenges with grape growing? Expand on that a little bit. What, uh, you know, for me, we had an extremely challenging wet summer. Right. Was that a problem for you sure. with grapes? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question to answer. You, you've just got to get your, first, I think the grower has to, has to get their mind wrapped around what's involved in growing grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot. Just a lot of little details, a lot of small decisions along the way. Like there's there's no one big secret to success. Like most things in life, it's it's just a lot of very small steps. And correcting then all little stuff. mistakes along yeah, the way. Yeah, correcting your mistakes, and yeah. finally you've made more good choices than bad choices, <laughs> and you say, yeah, it's working. You I'm know? still working on that piece. Yeah, right. Uh, so so you know, as far as the growing goes. You know, like, like anything else, just getting the soil prepared and weed control in the early years. You know, there's pests and diseases. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, understanding the training and, and how to train them, how to prune them. Uh, uh, th those, are, those are the challenges. And then, and then, of course, you know, dealing with the weather. Um, and, you know, you do, you do what you can. Mm -hmm. um, we, now, Sarah was mentioning a little before the interview that this we've now had a fairly nice uh, warm relatively dry period which right. is, has been perfect for in, you in apparently the, yeah yeah so I so, you know grapes you think of California or the Mediterranean you know they typically grow in a place with dry summers and so uh, we're kind of pushing a little because this is we don't always have dry summers in fact it seems like the last 10 years we've had more more trouble with wet weather than we have with dry weather um, so yeah, we we put up with the with the, all the rain in the early summer as best we could. You know, we had to do more disease control. We had to deal with weeds. Um, but once the kind of the weather turned around there, it's it's really been a nice summer for us. Um, you know, and it's Des dry and sunny. Describe the seasons all you know from spring through. Harvest. What are you? Yeah. What are your jobs? What are you? Um... Okay, so we we, we let's start in winter because we prune in the winter time. So and it's uh, it's it's a very skilled job and 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 it's you know tens of thousands of of individual cuts as as we go up and down the rows and, and, and how many just, people do you typically have? Yeah, helping well, with that? it changes from year to year. Um, la last year, I had a key employee who's now gone on to start his own uh, vineyard, but he, he did the bulk of it himself. Um, I would jump in occasionally, but, uh, uh, and, you know, it took him four or five months to get through the whole thing. Mm. You know, we start in December and, and finish probably in April. Mm. So, uh, so we get them pruned, uh, clear the brush out of the vineyard, um, burn burn the brush and piles just to eliminate a disease source um, next step is what we call a tie up you know and if there's lo loose uh, arms on the canes we go through tie them up to the white trellis wires um, and then the you know the weather the weather warms up and uh, we uh, you know keep an eye on the buds start to develop at that point you know we're looking at frost uh, there, there's not a lot we can do about frost danger. Um, and then, we're, of course, you know, from then on throughout the season, we're looking at insects and diseases. They, they have to be controlled. Um, there's, it's impossible to grow grapes without, without controlling them. Um, so we have- So you can't be in any way, shape, or fashion considered organic? Um, well, uh, there, there are, uh, people that have tried organic grape growing in Vermont, um, I admire what they do. Um, I don't think any of them have continued with it. They've, they've tried it um, and after a number of years realize that just can't do it. The, the organic materials that are available to this, you certainly can't do it without spraying anything. Yeah. And yeah. the organic materials that are available to spray are, are just not effective enough to maintain a healthy, to maintain a healthy vineyard. And so, uh, you know, they've, but it's possible to, to you know, to, to pick and choose, you know, the, the least toxic, the, you know, the smallest intervention sure. and still keep the, keep the vineyard healthy. 
So you know that's that's the route we go we go down, um, and uh, so you know we we have to do it. So in in a year like this where it rained a lot in the early summer, we have to spray a little more because the fungus diseases you know are have the perfect conditions to keep spreading. Once it dries out like this, we can cut way back because you know it's it's not wet. Don't have spray. You know. Is fungus one of the biggest problems? But fungus you... is the biggest problem. There's there's really only one serious insect um, that we have to keep an eye on, and but we monitor that closely and only spray when we absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you have to have some horticulture, some entomology, some yeah chemistry. Oh, all those yeah, all the, all those things, yeah. Um, so. So midsummer is fairly. Uh, so yeah, so midsummer is, is there's a pretty intensive workload because uh, the the key to growing uh, good grapes, to put it in a nutshell, is getting the sunshine to shine on the grape clusters while they're ripening, and of course, uh, the grapes, the shoots tend to grow in any direction, and a lot of them will grow right along the wire, where in in that position they're shading the grape clusters, and. And the sun's not getting to them. You're not going to make good wine. So we uh, we go through with the crew, and it's just it's just hands-on work. We grab those shoots and pull them from here where they're shading the grape clusters, and we pull them down so they're out of the way. And then we often rip a few leaves off uh, as we go. So the sun has you know right mm -hmm. around the grape grape cluster area. Mm -hmm. We call it the fruit zone. Mm -hmm. um, and then a year like this year when we had so much rain, the the vegetative vigor is just ongoing and so we've had to go through a second time and and do that again it's uh, it's it's really labor intensive but in the long run it, it really it's makes essential. a huge difference in, yeah. the, in the quality of the wine yeah how uh, is your crop looking this year right now the crop looks beautiful um, yeah. um, I'm surprised at how good it does look after the you know the rain in the beginning of the summer but we got through that you know we've had a couple of nice hot spells that have you know brought the development, the ripening development along, and uh, we've we've put in the time and effort, and as the business owner, the money to do all that uh, shoot positioning and leaf pulling, and uh, right now they're they're gorgeous, and and we we could be picking as soon as a week from now, which would be the first week of September, mm -hmm. which is really on the early side mm -hmm. for us, but uh, we like it. We like to have it early because then if. If we need to wait, we have a little bit of, you know, good weather on on the other end. Mm -hmm. If if we're mm -hmm. if we're pushed right to the end of the season, then then you know sometimes you're forced into a situation where you have to pick them because you know running out of we're weather. running out of running out of warmth and yeah. and uh, there's no point in waiting any longer. Yeah. Yeah. So the harvest time, you've got to try to gather up some competent and uh, yeah. enthusiastic you, harvesters. You, you bet. You How know, many people do you? Well, we on, on a good day, we can have... Can you go to Middlebury and drag some students out for no, the afternoon? No, that doesn't, that doesn't work. We do have the one, one biology, plant biology class comes out as, as one of their labs and picks grapes for an afternoon, which is kind of fun. The kids are enthusiastic. Um, we, we end up putting an ad on Craigslist um, and, and on just things like the front, front porch forum and yeah. things like that. And uh, year after year, we, we pull together a good crew. How many people do you? Yeah, so we usually end up hiring about six more people. Yeah. Uh, plus we have our regular employees who are here and sort of change, change gears in, into the harvest mode. So, you know, we might have, you know, eight or nine people working on a given day. And of course it's busy with the tourists are here for the fall foliage, so it's busy in the shop. As well, so yeah. we have to keep You're all that. A double whammy. Got to keep all that going. Yeah. At the same at the same time, uh, but it's you know we've been lucky uh, in terms of being able to pull a, a local crew together every year. I think it helps that it's grapes. People think grape picking is more exciting than whatever, whatever potato picking or something. Give them know. a little wine and give keep them, them yeah, happy. Yeah, we, we drink a little wine now and then. Sure. Now, how does the uh, harvesting actually work? You snip the grape yeah, clusters. Yeah, we have we have a little pair of lightweight shears. Uh, yellow plastic totes that hold about 28 pounds and uh, you just go along the row, clip, clip, and you get two or three clusters in your hand, put them, put them in the basket. Do you have to 
treat them. I've harvested yeah, yeah, apples. Yeah, so we treat we treat them gently. Even though you're going to be crushing them. Exactly. We yes. don't want them to crush too soon. Yeah. 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 Um, so we we treat we treat them gently, and and the the, the totes we use will will stack on top of each other, mm -hmm. so they don't crush the ones below. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we pick them, line up a bunch, you know, under the vines. We drive through with a tractor, and we just have a little homemade wagon that built just to fit two, mm -hmm. two uh, bins wide. And uh, so a little bit like apple second, harvesting. Yeah, um, a little bit um, like mini that. scale. Sure, and then of course we come come down here, and as soon as we, uh, you know, back the wagon into the our processing area that we call the, like every winery calls the crush pad because we crush the grapes there. We unload them into the crusher destemmer. Um, they go into the press or into the tank. We hose out the bins and put them right back on the wagon. The crew is out there. We try not to make them wait for empty bins because they're so gonna... it's instantaneous. You don't it's, store. Uh, oh no, uh, no, fruit. it's instantaneous. Yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. It, it's it's ongoing all the time. Um, and we we're paying the crew uh, a piece rate, so much per pound. So when when the wagon comes in, there all the bins are marked. So we. We run no, it over a scale, up. mark mark how many pounds it is, into the into the crusher it goes, mm. and and right back out. And so they'll they'll pick until about three o'clock or so, and then you know we'll have our final pickup. So we'll usually have a big load of grapes at the end of the day, and we'll process those, and you know hope to get out in time to get some sleep that yeah, night. Yeah, so you can be going late into the night. Yeah, you can. You can be going into the night. And uh, how long does the harvest take? Is this a month or? Yeah, a month or, or a little less. You know, if the weather is all good, three and a half weeks, something like that. And yeah. can you go through the vineyard in a clean sweep, or do you have to come back as fruit ripens? And um, no, it's a one time through. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one time through. Uh, we try to just just as the grapes change colors, which is usually early August. Um, we, we go through the crew that's been doing the shoot positioning and leaf pulling. We go through one more time looking for any clusters that are lagging, that are still green after the other ones have turned color, mm -hmm. and, and cut those off, just drop them on the ground. Because they will eventually turn color, but they'll be way behind the other ones, and, we don't, and they'll be under ripe at mm -hmm. harvest time, but there's no way to distinguish them then. Right. So we, we try to get rid of those so we're not bringing under ripe fruit in with the, uh, with the good ones. Would that alter the flavor of the wine? Yeah, it's, so, um, you know, as grapes ripen, the, the sugar levels are going up, the acid levels are going down, and the, the flavors are developing. So if you get ones that are under ripe in there, uh, I mean, the main issue, I think, would be that the acid, it would keep pushing the acid low, because we're right, we're always fighting kind of borderline high acid levels. Um, so we want to do whatever we can to keep that under any kind of threshold. Sweeten it up a little bit. Yeah. What's this? Exactly. I'm curious about this mechanism that can destem the, the yeah, grapes. How does that work? Is, a, is it a tumbler? Or? Yeah, yeah. So you dump it into a dump it into a hopper. It's got an auger that brings it down to one end. Um, and there's a uh, inside. It's it's covered, so you don't see it. But there's a, a cylinder with holes in it, and the holes are big enough for grapes to go through, but not for the grape stems to go through. Hmm. And it's it's rolling one way, and there's and down there there's there's a uh, shaft down the middle with little paddles off of it, mm -hmm. and that's turning the other way. Mm -hmm. And and those are angles, so they kind of pushes it from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. It kind of moves it along, slowly. And is there and a washing in that? No, there's no as there's well? no washing. Um, so those paddles are knocking the grapes off the stems and kind of flinging them through those little holes. The stems can't get through, and they slowly work their way down the cylinder, and then just dump mm -hmm. out onto the ground at the end, right? And then, then there are, beneath that actually does another thing. Beneath that, there are, there is a pair of matched rubber rollers that you can set the distance on as to how f much you want to crush them, and they'll go through that and get crushed. Mm -hmm. um, and then they come through, and at that point, it's just you know what we call the must. It's a mass of crushed grapes, and uh, we can we have big big three-inch hose. We can pump that. Pump that out. How did you? I mean, we've just talked about the grape growing. Yeah. Now, tell me a little bit about the winemaking process. Or, first of all, how many pounds of grape? What's your yield? How many pounds? Yeah. Do you talk oh, yeah. about that? Pounds sure. Per gallon? Yeah. We we um, you know, it varies, of course, from year to year. I would say, kind of a, we're not necessarily shooting for the highest possible yield because with grapes, when you get to a really high yield, it tends to dilute the flavors and the sugars to some extent and the wine quality wouldn't be as good. 
So we're, we're shooting for that kind of that, that perfect balance point where we have a good solid yield, but we haven't overshot it, you know, to the point where we're compromising the wine quality. So for our 12 acres, you know, a kind of a, a, a yield number that we would be shooting for would probably be about 85,000 pounds of grapes, you know, 40 some tons. Uh, and yeah, so, and so what does that turn into in terms of wine? Um, we make about a little over 2,000 cases of wine. And a case is 12 bottles. There's three quarters of a liter in a bottle. So that's nine, nine liters in a case of wine. Once, once you get into the wine world, <laughs> you, you get out of gallons yeah, into, into, liters. into liters. Yeah, sure. every, everything, everything in terms of grams and liters. You yeah. know? When I go home, we're back to ounces <laughs> and pounds. Convert. But over here, everything is grams and liters, just because yeah. just that's the way it's all, sure. it, it all works. Um, so yeah, and, and so the, the, red, the red grapes, uh, bring them in on the wag them, put them through the crusher, goes through that must pump into the hose, into the tank. We add the yeast, the entire uh, grape ferments together because uh, during, for about the first week. During that week, uh, the wine as it's developing is, is extracting flavors and colors from the skins that are in there with it. And then after that week, roughly, we'll press it. Uh, then we have just the pure wine and the skins and the seeds we'll separate, just take out and compost. So I'm still confused. During this process, you're continually adding no, more from no, the we harvest? No, we, we add, yeah, good question. Uh, we'll fill up one tank at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, yeah, within a day, mm -hmm. you know, whatever we pick that day, we'll fill up a tank. Um, so that tank is, is a unit, and, okay. and, we, and, that, and that goes through the winemaking, that ferments, you know, together. Um, so during that week, twice a day, we, we pump the wine off the bottom of the tank and up over the top of the tank because as soon as, uh, as, soon as it starts to ferment, all those little carbon dioxide bubbles um, grab a hold of the grape skins and push them up to the top. Mm. So you get what we call the cap at the top mm -hmm. and then the juice becoming wine in the middle and then the seeds settle to the bottom. Mm. But we want to have contact, for the reasons I said, between the wine and the skins. So we pump it over and, you know, and, and wet down that cap and let the, let the wine and juice and wine trickle down through those skins at least twice a day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So then at the end of the week, we, we, we pump off the, the, what we call the free rind, the wine that separated itself in that middle section, mm -hmm. and then we shovel the skins into a uh, press and press those. Yeah. To get out any residual. Yeah, get out whatever. And then that, that press wine, we call it, is, is different from the free one wine. Usually the, the flavors aren't as delicate, it's a little rougher tasting, but it tends to have more tannins, which is a nice component to wine. So we're, we're sort of tasting that. We might keep it separate, just ferment it separately, then blend it back in later. Hmm. Or we may be tasting it as it's pressing, and you know, the, the harder you press it, the, it changes continuously as you're pressing. We may kind of cut it off at a certain point and say, okay, anything that comes out, from now we'll put into a separate You must tank. be drinking wine every night. Oh, it's, somebody's got to do it, man. It's tough. <laughs> I think it's, it's great. Tough. Yes, we got a full tank. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> there you go. Linda picks up each of the cases of empty bottles and slaps them down on the table and then two at a time she puts some of those little valves actually give a small squirt of nitrogen in each bottle which blows out the cardboard dust and actually replaces all the oxygen in the bottle with the nitrogen and when we then go to put them on the filler that just means that the wine doesn't have any oxygen exposure and the nitrogen doesn't really matter at all. So then the next person grabs each bottle, pops them on the filler. It's a gravity filler. That same person takes it off, puts it to the one side, and the corker, Eric, today, grabs a full bottle, puts it on the corker. The corker actually pulls a vacuum in the little two-inch space in the neck of the bottle, sucks out all of the air, and then pops a cork in, puts it back in the case. So every bottle's been handled at least four times before it goes to sale. You always a wine 
drinker, or is this something that you've... No, you know, people ask me that, and I enjoyed wine, but I was not really serious or fanatical about it, or really, really that knowledgeable about it. I very much came to this from the farming side, rather yeah. than the, yeah. wine, yeah. the wine side. Uh, but of course, as I've gotten into it, I've learned a tremendous amount about wine, and, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. You know, it's a wonderful thing to know about. It's, it's a whole world of, of experience to, to, you know, it, to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's, been, it's been one of the more satisfying parts about doing it. I'm sure it's, it's, it's very just, it's rewarding. Just learning, learning, to, it, learning all about it. Yeah. You yeah. bet. And it's not, you know, it's, it's not some great mystery that you have to have, you know, some specialized knowledge about. The, the main thing is just to taste a lot of different kinds of wines and take the time to pay attention to what you're tasting. And yeah. all of a sudden you start to see patterns and recognize certain flavors and then it all clicks into place. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a look at our uh, range of wines. We make 10 different wines. There are two uh, grapes with the biggest production are Marquette and La Crescent. Uh, Marquette is our dry red wine. This is all, overall our biggest selling wine. Uh, we also make a rosé from the Marquette grape, which is same grape, different winemaking technique. We call that Heartwood. That's, that's a new wine for us. That's been really popular. The uh, La Crescent is a white wine grape, and uh, we actually make three different wines from that. We make uh, the one we call just La Crescent, which is uh, on, the, it's not completely dry, but it's on the dry side with just a small amount of residual sugar. Uh, then we also make a sweeter version, which we call Ragtime White. And uh, that's, it's not only sweeter, but it's got a little different flavor profile as well. And it's got a little spiciness to go along with the sweetness. Then, then we make one we call Late Harvest, which is sweeter still. Uh, and this is, this is more of a, just a pure fruit flavor with a you know, nice uh, mouthfeel to it and, and uh, really delicious as, as kind of a dessert wine or you know, something with an aged cheese. And a, a nice aged Gouda cheese would be, yeah, perfect, there you would be go. perfect with this. <laughs> yeah. But we have, we have ideal conditions for making ice wine mm -hmm. here. Right now, the kind and of... And talk the, about that a little bit. Yeah, ice wine is the grapes are actually frozen. Yeah, and so right now the world center of ice wine production is Ontario, Canada. But uh, it's, it's really... The conditions here are better. We have better grape varieties. We have more consistent cold weather in the early winter. So ice wine is a dessert wine. It's made by leaving the grapes on the vines into the early winter. You pick them the first time it reaches 18 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, they're about three quarters frozen. But what freezes is pure water. And the one quarter that's not frozen is concentrated sugar. of everything else. All the flavors, sugars are in that one quarter that's not frozen. So you press the grapes where they're still frozen, you leave the water behind as ice crystals, and you get this super concentrated juice. And uh, it's, it's just a fabulous product. And that is something that you're working on? Oh, we, we make it. Yeah. We make it now. Well, what I'm saying is I think Vermont has the potential, but we sell it all here. Mm -hmm. We sell it all right here. It's not a big production item for us. It sells at a, at a very high price because it takes so many more grapes. Sure. And there's a lot more risk involved. And you're cold. Yeah. When you're harvesting. You're, just cold, you're cold, right. <laughs> um, but if some... I just want to back up a minute. Sure. Uh, thinking about um, regions of production. Are people doing this over in New York State, across the pond? Uh, there are, there are some. Uh, I'm not as familiar with what's going on over there. Um, there's, there are a few starting in the Champlain Valley, and then actually there's a little cluster getting started over in the St. Lawrence Valley, kind of north of Watertown in, in that area. Anything in the Connecticut River Valley or uh, not Yeah, quite? There's, there, there's some uh, vineyards going over there. You know, I think the Champlain Valley tends to be a little drier, a little less foggy in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so the conditions are a little bit better here, but we're, we're, we're still, you know, a, an emerging grape region goes through a, uh, a transition and you can tell when, when you're sort of starting to be serious and that goes, and that's from when people plant grapes on the land they happen to own already to when people start looking right. for good land right. that's suited to grapes. Yeah. And that really hasn't happened in Vermont yet. yet. And, um, but Sarah's coming along. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that could happen. I mean, we, we obviously planted grapes on the land we happen to have. Right. It's, it's 
pretty good for grapes. It's not perfect, I would say. The, our biggest problem here is the soil is just too rich and fertile, you know, mm. which causes all that vegetative growth I was talking about right. that we have to deal with in the early summer. What a problem to have. Yeah. Well, it, 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 <laughs> it is, is a problem. A problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the ideal grape regions are on, on you know, this kind of poor, gravelly, bony mm. soil. And, and really, there's no magic to that. It's just that they don't grow so much, so the yes. grapes get a grapes lot more are, sun. Yeah. You know, it's all about getting the sun on those grapes. Yeah. Um, so I think there are good sites in Vermont. Um, I think I know what they are, but I'm not going to be the one to go to go <laughs> develop them. Go develop them, yeah. but maybe maybe somebody will. But as you're driving down the road, you think, oh boy, that would be a yeah. good spot. I, I think you know, just to, to spell it out, I did, in this kind of the southern Champlain Valley, kind of from Shoreham all the way down to like West Haven. Yeah, on the hilltops, there's this shaly soil. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called Farmington for the most part. And I think those those shaly hilltops in the southern Champlain Valley, I think that that is just the perfect the perfect environment for. So there you go. That's the tip grapes. of the day. You just spilled yeah, the beans. There you go. <laughs> um, so people ask me sometimes, you know, how has climate change affected uh, grape growing here? Well, actually, people say, well, the reason we're growing grapes in Vermont is because the climate's warming up. No, it's not. It's, yeah. be it's because of the new genetics Developing we have, yeah. Yeah, these new varieties. Um, I don't know what climate changes can do. All I can say is, you know, looking over the last, you know, eight, ten years, what it seems like is that it's just getting more rain, you know, more and more and more Particularly rain. Particularly early in the season Especially is what I Especially early in the see. season, yeah. I mean, so, which is not good for us. Um, the winters are milder, but that's not really, it seems, but that's not really a big issue for us because these grapes are adapted to a cold winter anyway. Yeah. You know, frost, you know, if we start getting like early heat waves and then turns back to cold, right. you know, that could be an issue, but that that's kind of always happened, I guess. Um, so it, it's hard to know if, if, you know, the successive rainfall is kind of our local version of climate change. That's that's not good for us, but you know, that that seems to be the, kind of the only consistent change that I've seen right, recently. Right. Yeah. Yeah, our lifespan our lifespan is relatively short to be talking. Right. I, I feel clearly we are seeing some changes and some pretty dramatic changes. Yep. It concerns me that those changes are gonna accelerate. Right with time, but right. um, just have to do what we can yeah. with it. Marketing, you uh, wholesale yeah, wine so around we, the state? Yeah, we, we have or? a distributor uh, who b picks up our wine, uh, takes it to stores and restaurants around the state. Just within Vermont? Just or do within you go Vermont, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, then we, uh, we also have our little shop here and in terms of volume, I think we sell probably two thirds of the wine right here out of our shop. Wow. And the other third is going through the distributor. Um, obviously, like every farmer, we like to get the full retail dollar if possible. So we like to, we like to sell it here. Um, but it also is great to have our product spread around where people see it and become aware of us, uh, you know, and maybe even come visit us someday. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Um, and you you get a nice flow of visitors. We do, yeah. It's, do you get a lot during the harvest season? People sure. curious about. Yeah, we we do. Um, you know, it's definitely. Uh, I mean, we have our local kind of our local customers and our tourists, and the yeah. tourists are important. Um, yeah. And you know, we can't we can't do without them. Uh, and but we, our local people are our repeat customers, and we want to treat them right too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, you know, we, we build in some incentives for people to come, you know, price incentives for people to come back and, and you know, give us the repeat business, which is, you know, good for them and, and helps us, you know, build loyalty sure. with, with people. And then, of course, we do events. Um, we have every other Friday, we have a band here and it's free. People can come bring a picnic and we get, well, you can ask Greg, we get, we get fabulous crowds here. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Two dollars in the jukebox, a dime at a time. Play the same old song about love gone wrong till close of time. Two dollars ought to do me, buddy, you buy the wine. And I'll feed that jukebox one dime at a time.
to say that the the response we've gotten, people just love it. They just think it's a it's a fabulous thing. It it feels like the it feels like kind of a community gathering, yeah, yeah. more than a commercial event. And of course, we're selling wine by the glass, uh, so that you know that's a little more profit margin for us because we're selling it that way. And the admission is free. The only money we're taking in is the sale of our own agricultural product. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's still, and you know, we're allowed to sell our own product on our farm, even yeah. though it's not a commercial zone. So we're we're still within the letter of the zoning laws mm -hmm. uh, that way. Are there liability challenges with that, or does it go? Pretty oh, we, we have all kinds of insurance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we pay a lot of money for insurance. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and for for sure. Yeah. Now, what are your uh, hopes and aspirations for the business? You have. 12 acres would you like to expand that or um no i think i think uh we're we're at where Capacity. where we want to be and there's there's a pretty good balance between the grapes we can produce uh the size of our facility and kind of what we can do in terms of marketing mm -hmm. now um plus i'm 60 so um you know i'm not really out to conquer the world anymore um, you know, it was a lot of years to get this up to where it was operating in the black, and I just want to see it see it work. Yeah. Um, as far as challenges go, uh, I mean, our main challenge is just to keep making the wine quality better and better. You know, I mean, we feel good about where it is, but it can always be better. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so we're always working both on the grape growing techniques and the wine making techniques uh, just to see how we can get a get a better product. So Chris, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a, a wonderful educational opportunity for uh -huh. me. Beautiful facility you have, and uh, it was a pleasure to have a little walk out in the vineyard. And you, you bet. Well, thank, thank you. It's, it's fun to stop for a minute and, and be forced to step back and look at the big picture, because a lot of times, like most farmers, we just have our heads down and are worried about the next hour. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of fun just to, to stop and, and talk about it with another farmer. So I've, yeah. been, I've enjoyed the conversation. Well, good. We'll be up for one of your wine tastings our, and a our, music night for yeah. sure. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. Very good. Thanks. Thanks.